my name is Emily, and I am here today with the nationally recognized authority and trust clause litigation, Dan Dalton. How are you doing today, Dan? I'm great, Emily. Christmas is just around the corner and looking for a great new year. How are you? I'm doing well. I know. I can't believe it's already the holiday season. Here we are. Dan, a lot has happened in the United Methodist Church this year. Can you give us an overview of what happened in 2023? Yeah, so let's talk about success stories. We're reading a lot in UM News about um, darkness and not great things happening for the denomination. But let's start talking about some success stories that uh, we've had as a firm and our clients. Um, there's been an extraordinary year uh, for uh, churches leaving the United Methodist Church. The global, uh, the GCFA, GCFA, I'm sorry, uh, issues a report. And the last one on November 30th uh, showed that 7,800 churches have disaffiliated since 2019, which is a, a tremendous amount, much more than anybody I, I think has ever anticipated. We've probably represented about a thousand of those churches. I know we don't really keep track of numbers, but uh, most of the clients that we worked with have gone through disaffiliations and it's been friendly. Uh, others have not, and we've been in litigation, but for the most part, we've helped churches through these things uh, and come out the other side on their own. Uh, some have joined denominations, some haven't, uh, but uh, these local churches have been doing great. They're they're growing. Uh, there's a lot of excitement within them. Um, you know, the, the newly free churches are doing really well. We started the year off great with uh, a win in Florida, in Tampa, Florida, on, for uh, Bayshore Christian School. Formerly Bayshore United Methodist Church had a property uh, where there was a, a uh, elementary school that the conference wanted, a very valuable piece of property. And uh, the Florida law is not very helpful for local churches, uh, but we were, we were able to uh, prevail at a jury trial in that matter on a prescriptive easement claim. We then went to Los Angeles and helped a, a Presbyterian church out called the Young Neck Presbyterian Church. And uh, that was a church with a lot of assets. Uh, about $100 million worth of land and uh, about $10 million worth of uh, financial assets and uh, a very toughly fought matter where the denomination wanted all those assets. And we prevailed in that one on behalf of the local church. So that was a, a great win. Uh, we won in Searcy, Arkansas, uh, where we had a case that uh, we filed a motion for preliminary injunction. Searcy was one of the three churches that was not let out. Uh, Cabot, one of those churches, just decided to walk away. Searcy sued. They won, and uh, they retained their property, and the case was settled, so that was great. Um, we also had a, a cases that didn't go into litigation, which I think really are the big wins, ones that we kind of stayed in the background, but we helped guide those churches, uh, such as St. Luke's uh, Church in Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma City uh, in, in particular, that was, was the largest church after Asbury in Tulsa, and Asbury was a client we helped work with a couple of years ago. So St. Luke's got through that disaffiliation vote and, and is out and is thriving. Uh, we've helped Cornerstone Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It was the largest United Methodist Church in Michigan. Uh, they're out. They're doing great. We've helped Good Shepherd Church in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, uh, with great church led by Talbert Davis. Um, most recently, Wesley Memorial in High Point, uh, North Carolina. West Wesley Memorial, we consider the Vatican of the United Methodist Church, and that got out. In Long's Chapel, as well, in North Carolina, right at Lake Genesca, right at the heart of where all the retired bishops and uh, clergy live around Lake Genesco, uh, we helped that church out. So there's been a lot of great victories we've had uh, in our clients have had throughout the uh, year. The Jonesboro case in Arkansas continues to be litigated. Um, that case has had an effect throughout the country where uh, Arkansas is now a verb within conferences where they don't want to get Arkansas, where uh, they have uh, conferences have let churches go because they don't want to get into litigation. And churches have left Arkansas's conference afterwards where the conference itself has seen a uh, you know, the the result, the net effect of, uh, of uh, what happens or they in, improperly close a church. So that's really had a, a good um, impact on churches in Arkansas and throughout the United States. The case continues on and, and we'll continue with that one as well. And in the United Methodist world, um, things may be going well. Uh, the, all the bishops gave themselves a raise. 
which is shocking to me, but they did. Um, as of November 30th, like we said before, a report of 7,800 churches are, are have left since 2019. Um, budget cuts uh, has been about 40% this year to date. Uh, they'll continue on uh, because they just, the, the conferences and the denominations just cannot financially sustain themselves. Um, and churches who have left the denomination in, really have grown. Uh, churches that have stayed in the denomination where maybe a vote is lost have uh, or, or just chosen not to leave have either stagnated or have uh, or really kind of uh, taken a hit and, and reduced themselves as well. So we're seeing a lot of growth on churches leaving, a lot of uh, economic and, and uh, lack of people uh, joining the United Methodist Church. And I'm sure everything will kind of shake out afterwards, but this has been an, an incredible year from that perspective. What are some of the trends you saw in 2023? I think the biggest trend we're seeing is senior pastor transition. Um, the average age of a senior pastor right now is 57, <clears throat> which is pretty young, you know, since I'm 58. But um, I think that a lot of churches are looking to see what is going to happen next when our pastor retires and, you know, or, or wants to retire. Uh, when those senior pastor transitions occur, uh, and they're outside of a denomination. There are search firms that are out there that will help search for churches, but especially in larger churches, uh, it's hard to find that perfect fit or that good fit. And so we're seeing a, a challenge there. But we also know that most churches, I think it's over 90% of all churches in the Protestant world have less than 150 members. So they're relatively small churches. And those are the churches I think are, are we're going to see the challenge in where the senior pastor retires or wants to retire, and there's really nobody behind them to pick up. You know, the seminaries are, for the most part, not full of people. Um, you know, there's not a lot of young deacons joining. In fact, there's, you know, the last report showed there's some conferences where no, there's been no deacons. Uh, there's been nobody coming up through the ranks. Uh, so we're going to see a, a very interesting time uh, want that senior pastor transition where I think a lot of people are going to feel guilt and stay longer than maybe they should. Um, but I think that um, that is the number one issue that we'll be facing, uh, that's facing now and then also facing in the future. Hand in hand with that, I think we're going to see is mergers. Um, we're going to, we on average every year, there's about 6,000 churches that close um, and about 3,000 churches merge on top of that. Uh, in the United States. So I think what we'll see is there's different types of mergers. There's the, the healthy merger with two healthy churches join. Um, and when you have those senior leader transitions, I think we're going to see, because of the inability to find a new leader, we're going to see some mergers uh, from that perspective. We're going to see churches that are older. They have lots of good assets. Um, they just have nobody behind them, but maybe they're renting space to another church that's growing and younger. We're going to see those churches merge. I mean, a very successful uh, merger like that is the People's Church in Franklin, Tennessee. That was older. It's been around for over 100 years. And Church of the City, which is a relatively new church. It's about 10 years old. A really dynamic pastor, Darren Whitehead. Uh, that church has grown tremendously. And the People's Church uh, approached Church of the City to have them take over. And, and that church has just been tremendous. And, and, and so we'll see that. We'll see sick churches, churches that are financially hurting, uh, trying to merge. Those are kind of unsuccessful churches because there's just so much baggage at the outset, but you know, we'll see those attempts to occur. Uh, we'll see churches that, uh, you know, where there's a, a division among members, for example, where leadership leaves or uh, in, in addition to pastors, but they have a fine asset um, and we'll see those mergers. So I, I We've seen a, a number of upticks in mergers this year, and, and we've worked with a number of uh, clients that have done that as well. Um, and uh, so we'll see that. And I guess the, the other thing too is, is we've seen pastors who have helped lead their church out of a denomination, and then the pastor gets recruited or decides to leave the church. So then the church is left in an unfamiliar position with having a building and having a church, but having a pastor. Uh, and that will that will and has uh, resulted in mergers as well. So that's, I think that's another trend we're seeing uh, moving forward. Um, 
we're also seeing Christian school enrollment increase uh, during COVID. Uh, there was a number of churches in, uh, that had private Christian schools uh, that stayed open or open earlier than public schools. Uh, parents like that, and you know, their kids went to the schools. And as a result of that, you know, the, they're, they're they're still there. Uh, the schools are busting at the seams. They need new space. They need to renovate. Uh, so we've been helping actually a number of churches around the United States and schools that are getting resistance on zoning matters from neighbors and local governments to expand. Um, so I think we're going to see a, that continue as well, the continued growth of uh, either uh, private Christian schools, private schools, or um, home schools that have their classical conversations, uh, the meetings once a week, we'll see uh, that as an increase. And, and here's something really interesting is, is we're seeing more people go to church. I know there's a decline, uh, and it's been widely reported, of a decline of people attending churches, pr primarily in the Protestant world. But there was just a recent uh, analysis done by Ryan Burge, who does a really wonderful substack uh, and looks at different trends in the church world. And he examined this specific issue. And what he found actually is there's still a whole lot of Christians uh, going to church in the United States. And it continues to be that way. What's interesting from his analysis though, it's white Christians have decreased from about 90% of uh, in, two, in 1972 to about 60% right now in, in 2023. But then you have evangelicals uh, and, and you have Latinos and African-Americans, especially Latinos, have increased going to church. So it's kind of evened out. And so the numbers kind of remain the same from 1972 until now as to the percentage of people going to church. It's just left less of one, uh, one race and more of another, which kind of even things out. So what that tells us is, is that a lot of churches are going to have to do outreach uh, and really focus on different types of ethnic groups to grow. Uh, so you see a lot in the Catholic Church right now in Latin America and in um, in the United States as well, working with Latinos and Protestant churches as well, um, in, in kind of trying to get ethnically diverse congregations, which is what most churches and parishes want. So, so we see a lot of that, and and it's it's pretty surprising because you read everywhere that. We're in a post-church world, which we may be uh, in the United States, but the number of churches, according to the analysis study, especially by uh, Ryan Bird, shows otherwise. It shows that actually there are still a whole bunch of people going to church and want to go to a church. Interesting. So then what do you see happening in 2024? Well, in 2024, what I see is uh, the UMC will continue to be uh, in decline and, and still continue to kind of spiral. Um, it's telling to me that there's still these blinders on where a lot of leadership in the UMC are thinking, it's not my fault. It's all these other people's fault, uh, for us to decline by giving themselves raises, you know, what, what other universe and what universe would a, would a leader of an organization give themselves a raise when, you know, you just have a dramatic drop of people leaving. I mean, it, it makes no sense. I, I, I mean, it just, they may work hard and, and that they may feel like they're underpaid and that's fine. But the public perception of giving yourself a raise while this church is just swirling and in financial distress just makes no sense at all. Um, and, and I think that there's going to have a, a reckoning is going to occur there. I think there's a general conference coming up in 2024 where this regionalization uh, may or may not pass. I mean, there's no there's not enough votes for regionalization which is basically allowing each region around the world to have their own UMC uh, conference or their own doctrines and discipline. Um, that, assuming that all the delegates can get to Charlotte uh, in, you know, for the general conference in 2024, I don't see it passing. Um, I, th I think we're gonna see a, a, this continued fracture within the United Methodist Church uh, probably for another couple of years. And then we're gonna see a continued decline in attendance. Uh, one thing we have noticed is, is the membership numbers continue to be stagnant, uh, according to UM data, but you really have to dig into the attendance. That's really kind of where you see people, people who attend are the people who give and the people who are active. And it's about a third to a quarter of the number of memberships. So we'll, we'll see that continue to, to drop as well. Um, we'll see the general conference, which I think is not going to be as 
amicable and friendly as what some people folk uh, believe. Um, be, just because of this whole regionalization uh, that is occurring, it's kind of driving a wedge in that uh, annual conference. You're also seeing centrists now uh, in the United Methodist Church are kind of waking up and saying, hey, we kind of stuck with the wrong people with the progressives because we've lost all our power. We're out of all our positions. We have no bishops that support us. Um, we're we're kind of lost here. So I think you're going to see another wave of churches uh, leave uh, primarily through litigation uh, uh, in the next in 2024 and the following years, uh, which is going to leave a lot of local churches in chaos, which they'll lose continue to lose uh, membership uh, along the way. So we'll see a lot of that. We'll see a lot of uh, former United Methodist churches in urban areas on valuable property be sold uh, just because you just can't continue a, a large piece of property with 20 people there. And, you know, it, it, you, you know, like here in Detroit, we've got uh, we've got two large churches downtown, uh, which with an average attendance of 30 in each one. I mean, you just can't continue that. Um, so I, I think they're going to. The, that real estate uh, like that in urban areas will will uh, go as well. So we'll see that happening. And then we'll see the Global Methodist Church, you know, will kind of get its footing. Um, you know, they're having their annual conference coming up in next year as well. We'll see how that goes. I mean, the big issue there is bishops. Are there going to be bishops? The answer is probably so. What is the power of the bishops to be determined? Um, how the Global Methodist Church is going to fund itself? That's to be determined as well. I know they have a percentage, but it's voluntary. Um, so if it's voluntary, that means you can volunteer zero if you want. Um, and then also no trust clause, which is which means uh, there's going to be a number of churches that are going to look at this and and say, boy, why? You know, I joined it to get out, but it, has this really benefited me? Um, and I think we're, you know, I've already heard discussions about that already. Whether that will happen or not, I don't know. But uh, when I see that, you know, the footing of the Global Methodist Church is going to be in flux for the next year or two as well. So it's it'll be an interesting year in 2024. I don't think it's been quiet at all in this area. I think it'll continue to uh, uh, to kind of rear its head and, and uh, decisions will be made uh, based on how reactions occur from these different interest groups. Well, as always, thank you for your insight, Dan. If your church is interested in more information or hiring our firm, please reach out to our office at 313-859-6000 or email us today. Thank you.